What's going on, Frank? How's your morning going, buddy? Uh, doing all right. Um, What's with the face? I don't know. I It's the weirdest thing. I'm not feeling great today. I am just went to bed with a migraine. And first time in my life I ever woke up with one. So, mm. um, yeah, playing hurt today, but all good. What'd you do this morning well, Johnny, to, try to try to cure it? Yeah, I'll uh, probably give you a bigger headache. Dr- drank a head. liter of water and took an Excedrin. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk as much. Well, I'm out of Johnny, ideas. Johnny woke up with a stomach ache. Yeah. Um, so he was a little late getting to our pre-show meeting and, you know, I wasn't late, but, uh, rocket decided to roll in, I think deer shit this morning. So I had to <laughs> get him all showered off before the show. So everybody's That's dealing with uh, for dogs. Why would you everybody's, roll in it? Yeah, I, I mean, rock, you've <laughs> met rocket before he's, he's a goofy guy. So, um, let's get right into it, Frank. Cause, cause you know, we don't want to take too much of your time today. Like we normally do. Um, and, and I think there's a number of, of UFAs, I think that, that we're kind of curious to know if, if there's been any rumblings about, but the place I wanted to start with you today, there were reports going around social media, um, actually a college hockey reporter that, that I, I see quite often was wrote in his newsletter this morning in a sub stack that the NHL GMs were briefed. And I don't really know what they mean by briefed on the fact that the CHL and the NCAA or the NCAA is close to potentially declaring CHL players eligible to play college hockey. Um, There's ins and outs of that, that we could probably talk about for days, but we won't get into that. My question to you, because you were at the GM meetings is what does that mean? They were briefed on it. Like how much detail? I don't think very much. Um, it wasn't a big topic of conversation. At least it didn't make it or trickle out very far to a lot of us. Um, I think there's been rumblings of the NHL and CHL or NCAA and CHL in conversation for a while. It seemed like, I don't know, three months ago, maybe a bunch of college hockey coaches came out and sort of poured cold water on the idea. I don't, I'm just going to take a step back and and offer a personal opinion. I I don't think the NCAA needs to do anything. I get the idea of NIL deals and how it's changed the college landscape and essentially the money that some players, you know, if any, are putting in their pockets at the NCAA level is very similar to what CHL players are getting. My point is, if you look at the dynamic of how college hockey has shifted in the last five to eight years. Some of the very best NHL prospects are already choosing the college route right away. Why would you alter and or cave things when it feels like you're close to delivering a knockout blow to the CHL anyway? Just my thought. Like, why would you, why would you move forward and say, Oh, Hey, Guys, come on down. No issue. Play CHL and then come here. I think, if anything, that's just going to put the NCAA in its own way. Because part of, to me, the biggest problem in the NCAA is that it's become a league that caters to 20 to 24-year-olds, and it's too old. That's changing. That's That trend has been changing, and you're seeing true natural 18-year-old freshmen step in and be impactful players, and then obviously go on to successful NHL careers. But I'd like to see the league get younger, and I'd like to see that push be made, because I I think to me it's clear what the best development path is for anyone with significant NHL prospects is to come play college hockey. Well, hold on, Johnny. I just want to finish I just want to finish this this thought with Frank. Um I'm not, uh, while I don't necessarily disagree with you, Frank, what I would say is, is I'm not sure they're going to have a choice. We, we see the NCAA taking a loss almost every other week right now in the courts about amateurism and what that really means. And, and, you know, these, there are players in college that are making a ton of money now, a ton of money from their schools and cost of attendance and Alston money and, and all these other things. And then the other thing that I would say to you is, is I agree with you. Like the league, when you look at the big name schools and the big name programs, 
with all the national championships in the history of college hockey, Michigan, BU, BC, Denver, North Dakota, those teams have these star freshmen. They do. And mm -hmm. in the last, let's say, three seasons, really, really impactful freshmen, 18-year-olds, Celebrini and and all the kids at BC and Cutter Go Power really, and Michigan. Uh, exactly. Yeah, Michigan. One, what, the Hughes brothers. And the, I mean, it's like the big programs. I think where you see a lot of the older kids is at the programs that are trying to find a way to compete with BC and BU and Michigan. So they're going and finding the 20 year old out of the USHL um, or well, but Quinnipiac starting to get the really but, top end guy. But here, here's what I'd say is that has changed. That's, the, that's only really in the last five to 10 years at the most, because before a lot of those top end, you know, the Owen power kids would be, they'd be staying in Canada to play CHL hockey mm -hmm. for the most part. So what's changed is now some of the best 17 to 18 year old players in the world are choosing college hockey first. And then that's causing a trickle effect through the rest of the sport where, you know, other top players are choosing that route. You even have a couple, you know, every now and again, top end European players that are coming over and choosing college hockey. Yeah, look at Willander, the kid from the Canucks who just went to BU 11th overall. And then now it's trickling down because the rosters are changing over as a result mm. of that. BU, BC, Michigan, all these other teams can begin to play players of that age. And then, like you said, there's a catch-up process. But that wasn't the case. Like, Owen Power choosing to play NCAA hockey 20 years ago would never crazy. in a million years It would have been crazy. But yeah. do you think – but let me just ask you, and this, and then I promise, Shawnee, you can take well, it. Well, I want to chime in on this too, don't, actually. Don't, don't you think <laughs> part of that is because – they're, you're looking at it and you're going, okay, I can play against some of the best 16 to 19 year olds um, in Canada. There, look, you can't doubt that that's good hot like OHL. There's there's plenty of good players, but if if you're Power or you're Celebrini, you're like, I can go do it against some of the best 18 year olds, 19 year olds, but up to 24, 25 year olds. Like I'm playing against guys who, yeah, they're not as skilled, but they're men. And that's going to get me ready for the next level. So I think that's one of the reasons these guys are choosing it because they're playing against. There's a million reasons. Men. That's that's not just that's that's I would say that's a small part of it. I would say the other part is that now, you know, with the way the draft works and your rights, let's say you happen to be a third round pick who lingers in college hockey a few years, you play three years and all of a sudden your team's trying to sign you and you have the option to either sign or you, you know, a fourth year, you play one more year and you get to August and you become a total unrestricted free agent. So you're not hamstrung by that. Um, you have the ability to get an education while you play. I know people would say, oh, that's still the case in the CHL. But, you know, a lot of times after high school, players stop going to school. Um, the other part, too, is um, when you look at the status of the CHL, it's, it's watered down. The competition isn't great. There's too many CHL teams in the OHL, WHL, um, NQ to, to really harness the talent that the country is producing. When you have 90 teams or whatever it is in, in the CHL, there's just not enough talent around to fill out the rosters 20 deep of those teams and make them entirely competitive. So you mash all those things together and you add in, you know, some national TV appearances, a Frozen Four. I mean, there's a reason why it's become a really, really attractive option. Also, I think, I don't know if it was Colby who mentioned the money, but you can make more money now playing college hockey than you can playing in the CHL. And also... So what are... So like, Johnny, you'd know this. Like, yeah. what are what are guys making? Uh, I'm pretty sure from what I've heard, it's north of like $20,000. A semester. A semester. Yeah. Yeah. Like at, at like if at you're Boston a, if College, you're a top guy. Yeah. Yeah. At Boston College, those guys are making in Alston money and in cost of attendance money, which are school funded checks. Those guys are getting about twenty, twenty five thousand a semester. Now they're able to do it at BC because they have football, they have basketball, they've got they've got this this pool of money. 
BU doesn't pay their players cost of attendance or Austin money. Those guys have to go out and get their own NIL deals or rely on an alumni type of collective for that type of situation. But most of these kids are getting decent money at, at these schools. Big 10, Big yeah. 10 schools are paying even more. Um, so they're making good money, Frank. Some of these guys could be making 50 to 100 grand uh, a year on top of a scholarship that pays for food, tuition, living, books, like the whole You're not boat. making that in the CHL. No. No. And and some of them might not make that much in the American League either. I mean, the top guys will wit would, but I'm just saying in American League max Some of the top end I I believe some of the top end CHL players are getting essentially advances from their agents too. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that pays for a lot of stuff. I also wonder if the transfer portal stuff has made it more popular too. Like you can, if you're, you're not stuck. Yeah, exactly. Like even in the CHL, listen, I don't know how the CHL really works. I never played in it, but I imagine like you can get traded to a place you don't really want to be at. Whereas if you choose a college and you don't, and you aren't happy, you can just pick another place to go if you're that good. Right. Like a team will want a prospect who's that good. And if, like, if, you know, if I'm a top guy and I go to Michigan and I'm unhappy, but I'm still that highly touted prospect and I've changed my mind. And I want to go to North Dakota. I'm sure that wouldn't really be the biggest of issues. Right. It's I mean, like going from UMass to Mercyhurst. Well, I think we, <laughs> well, I think we've seen who's, who's the player Colby that when uh, was, there was a player that went from BC to BU. Jamie Armstrong, yeah. Bill Armstrong's son. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. I mean, that to me is the most sacrilegious thing I've ever yeah. seen. Like, but I, still. I, I struggle with that. I, I personally, and I like Jamie. I do. Um, I got to know him when he was a terrier, but I got to tell you, like, I, I, I mean, if you, I would do anything for another year of college hockey eligibility in my, I would give anything, do anything. I'd play for any team. If I, I wouldn't play for BC, I'd play for anybody <laughs> else, but I couldn't play at BC anywhere else. So out there, so let's put a bow on this yeah, conversation yeah. Yeah. and that that is my opinion. Why would the NCAA get in bed with the CHL? What's the incentive to do so? You're already winning the I, best. Like I said, some of the best I don't players. disagree with you, but I don't think they're going to have a choice. I think they know lawsuits will be coming, lawsuits that they cannot win. And so I don't think they have a choice. I think that's why. That's my opinion. Um, I just don't, and I've talked to NCAA lawyers, you know, people that specialize in working in these NIL situations and have been fighting in court against the NCAA. I don't think they have a choice. I think that's why Frank, I think they will lose and they will lose quickly. Like they lose every other, um, every other thing. So Johnny, let's keep it, let's keep it going. Let's get to some NHL, you know, yeah. related stuff. There's a number of guys we want to ask you about. Go ahead, Johnny. I'll give you the floor well, here. I'm just I'm laughing at Todd Weimer though. He said Johnny had an NIL deal with Heinz Ketchup, which I definitely fucking would have if I was playing in college today and, and that was the case. Yeah, I would kick um, you out of the league just for that. <laughs> but uh speaking of you know upcoming free agents, Colby and I were talking about Jonathan Marchessault with Vegas having another incredible year, 33 years old. Um, you know, what do you make of that situation going on in Vegas with bringing in Tomas Hurdle? Uh, you know, Vegas is a team we were talking about that doesn't necessarily build toward the future, but what would you give this kind of player right now who most likely will not be a Vegas Golden Knight next season? Yeah, I was going to say that's the biggest thing that stands out to me is, you know, when you look at Vegas and the success that they've had, I, I admire two parts of their aggression. One is they've been incredibly aggressive in going to acquire players, the shiny new toy on the market. They've brought in some of the biggest names since their franchise was founded in terms of making trades, making things happen, surprising people. How did they pull that off? All those things. On the other end of that, they've also been really aggressive in saying goodbye to pieces that no longer fit either by salary or by age, or in Marcia So's case, maybe both. Now, I know with the season that he's had, really kind of carrying this team through varying stretches when some of their top dogs have been out, you look at it and you would say, well, how could they possibly afford to say goodbye? This is essentially his third consecutive 60-point season. He's hitting 40 goals for the first time in his career. You know, this guy's aging like a fine wine. Why would we say goodbye? And, and to your point, when you bring in 
a contract like hurdle, when you are looking at your salary cap structure and situation and trying to fit in potentially Noah Hannafin this summer, how do you find a way to make all that money work? Yes, there's a cap increase coming. Yes, Alec Martinez is coming off the books at 525. So you hand the vast chunk of that plus half of the increase um, in the cap to Hannafin if you're keeping him. And then what do you do with Marcia so? I It's just, I have a hard time seeing the path for him to stay. Mm-hmm. But I think as as strong as his play has been, and it, again, doesn't seem like there's a drop-off coming, at some point there probably will be, right? So the big question teams are going to have to ask themselves is, what could we pay Marcia so and find a way to be comfortable with it? Does it mean overpaying on AAV to keep the term down? Or are teams just going to you know, continue to mortgage the future and say, hey, we're going to stretch this deal out as long as possible to keep the AAV down and we'll deal with the consequences on the deal later? I don't know. Me personally, I lean toward, hey, Jonathan Marshall, you know, I'm, I don't know, pick another contending team. Yeah. I'll give you two years at 7-5, which is a big yeah. raise or whatever it is, 8 million bucks, but it's only two years. Mm -hmm. And then we'll discuss after. And isn't there more complications around a 35 plus contract and how that gets bought out? Frank, isn't it just a little more difficult with the recapture penalties and whatnot when you give a guy a longer contract, that's going to be 35 or is it if they sign it once they're 35, do you know? You know have to be 35, so he's okay. not eligible. So he wouldn't be in a 35 plus contract. Correct. Okay, got it. Um, I got two flyers questions for you, Frank, around yeah. two situations. One I saw online and I I I rolled my eyes pretty hard, but I want to ask you to set the record straight. Um, and it's the Carter Hart going to the KHL thing. That can't possibly have merit to it, can it, Frank? Uh, I actually didn't follow up on that. Um, I mentioned the migraine. I, I saw that last night and on the surface, it actually makes sense if he can get permission from the Canadian government but because they your passport when you, when you're being charged with something, so apparently they did not take his passport and or limit his travel, I guess, as part of the cooperation. Um, that was some of the initial reporting. Again, I don't know if that's changed. I don't know exactly what the situation is, but if you're Carter Hart um, and you're going through this ongoing legal process, that's going to take quite literally years to play out. Like we're talking trial may not begin until 2026. If it gets that far, 2026, like that's, that's a long ways off. And how, like how, you got to keep, you got to keep playing. You got to keep earning. Like he's being paid this last year on his deal. None of the players in connection with this um, sexual assault uh, have been, have contracts that extend into next season, which I think is important to point out. And you, you've you got to try and earn a living while you're still in your prime, I would think. So on the surface, if if this is going to be a long and drawn out process and no NHL team is going to be taking you on, which I'd, I'd be very surprised. Then you, I, it makes sense to me to go there in the one place that you can kind of next season. Go. though, not this season. He, yeah, no, this, well, season, this season, this season. Okay. Over. That, okay. Got it. Okay. Here's my one other flyers related question, Frank. Um, they bring in Johansson at the trade deadline, right? Um, they put him on waivers right away. Then he says that he has some sort of injury, correct? And my question for you with Johansson or Johansson, however we're saying it, mm -hmm. that seems to change Ryan quite Johansson? a bit. Ryan Johansson. You just call him Joey since you seem to struggle with that. Yeah, I don't know him, so I'm not going to call him that. But... Um, what is how does it work as far as buying out a player that's injured? Can you Can't. buy out an so if he's got some sort of long term injury, what ends up happening with him next year? He just has to sit on their cap on and what they LTIR him. How, how does that work? So the short answer to that is yes. I think the Flyers are 
surprised and I guess you would say annoyed and or disappointed with how this has played out because in who in Colorado. Okay. Because apparently he arrived in Philly and went on waivers and took the morning skate. And then once he cleared, he thought he was going to play. And then once he was cleared waivers and was being ready to send, get sent down, learned he was getting sent down. He says, oh, oh, I can't go up. My hip hurts. So I think the Flyers were like, hold on a second here. No one had mentioned hip issue at a. Anson, at least my understanding is that he's seeking additional medical opinions about the hip. But the point is, yes, you you cannot be bought out if you're hurt. So what's in it for Johansson to have a hip issue and potentially surgery on the other end of it is you'd save yourself a few million dollars because that would be the Flyers' intention, I think, would be to buy him out in the summer. So he would get two-thirds of the $8 million that he's owed – well, only four from the Flyers, right? The buyout yeah, would only the be the Flyers. The money, money part is is rather irrelevant. Like if you look at it from the Flyers' perspective, they were they were planning to buy him out the whole time. Okay. Uh, I thought I was here to keep going, Frank. Oh no, um, yeah, so I was going to say, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> two thirds of that he, he'd be getting in his pocket. Um, mm. You know, uh, whatever eight times point six six as I do this math on the fly is for what's in it for Johansson is like $2.75 million that he'd save by having a hip issue. And I go hip issue Mm -hmm. because my, my question would be, doesn't every hockey player who has played 905 NHL games have a hip issue? My guess is probably yes. Yeah. Every guy literally. We talked about the hip issues. What was it last week, Colby, or yesterday? Even I don't even. Remember. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. we talked about um, it. John but, John Tortorella and Ryan Johansson have a long history, so yeah. that was never going to be a thing in Philly. But they basically Johnny just Boyd. said, "Hey, we'll we'll take on the contract if it means we can get a first round pick from you." That's how they right. worked their way into it with the Walker deal. Well, Frank, it I, was, sense. I was going to ask you about the Islanders and what they should do, but. I kind of want to just go in the direction of asking you what I should ask John Tortorella this morning uh, because I'm going to Flyers morning skate after the show and Colby wants me to basically get ripped apart by him. And uh, I'm I'm trying to hoping there's a viral moment. I'm trying to get some, some collab effort here from the chat. What are you, you. what are you looking to like? I would, yeah, I would, I would be careful uh-huh. getting in and not this is my first time interacting with him. So not for scared. the reason that you think it's more so just it's if you follow John Tortorella closely and his media interviews, if you ask a question, don't ask something that has an obvious answer. Mm-hmm. Like someone asked about Sam Erson, and they said, Oh, it seemed like there was a, you know, a couple he might like to have back. And I was like, he just went like this, like, and then walked off. Yeah. Because he made a statement, offered opinion, and then was like, react to it. That's not that's not how you get an answer. So he he can be incredibly insightful if you ask the right thing. Like, find something that you genuinely would like to know about. The thing I'd be curious about is he's had a lot of different teams in different situations. He's had Stanley Cup contender and winner. He's had team going for it with the Rangers. He's had a disastrous situation in Vancouver and then a team that was mostly mid in Columbus. Mm -hmm. Is this, has this season and this team been his greatest coaching challenge? That's what I'd be curious to know. Well, I was actually going to lean in the direction of, do you almost feel like you're coaching with house money because no one expected you to be in a playoff spot this time of year? But I don't know if that's a, his answer will be, you might not have expected it. Yeah, but you're not yeah. going to answer yeah, a good answer on that question. I know, that's why. Don't I kinda... ask him. Definitely don't ask him if he eats ketchup on pasta. Don't, yeah, don't ask him. Just, I just uh, wrote that in the chat, I think, right? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm definitely a little nervous about asking John Tortorella a question. I'd be, I'd be lying if I said Why be nervous? He's just another human being. Yeah. Yeah. 
But go into um, it with a curious mind asking a definitive question. Don't make any statements. Mm -hmm. Don't add in your own opinion and ask a real question. Should I just ask him how he spends his off weekends? Keep it light. <laughs> no. <laughs> Unless you're Colby and you want to talk about dogs. Yeah. That might be different, but I don't think that's the kind of mood he's going to be in. This Maybe we'll uh, we'll get some questions from the chat. Get a little help from the chat. But um, well, yeah, I just I, gave you I just gave you a question. Well, I'm I'm curious to hear what the chat say too. We don't ignore the people that listen. Oh, so he this. obviously no, I, doesn't. I, but I'm saying obviously, like, that Frank, could he obviously whole, doesn't like your question. No, that I could be a good. whole story on on dailyfaceoff.com. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I'm just curious to hear what the chat. Is this the greatest though. coaching challenge you've had? The biggest listen, coaching challenge. We listen to the people on this show, um, but. I guess Frank, do you uh would you be surprised if Lou Lamorell is still the GM of the Islanders next season? Uh surprised? No. Um saw him at the GM meetings. He is as mm -hmm. spry as ever. He had a couple wise cracks for us mm -hmm. in the media. Um I, I think you know his track record speaks for itself. I think clearly the New York Islanders ownership is on board and in line with the way he runs his team. Um, you know, for me, like it's not a surprise to see a hall of fame GM, regardless of how distant that success has been to continue on to me. I, I, I think the Islanders need change and I don't know that it necessarily has to be Lou Lamorello. That's the change. It's just that he so hasn't. Then what, showed, well, then what? What change are you talking about? He hasn't about shown. Then? He hasn't shown any willingness to change his approach in building this team. It's been double down, triple down, quadruple down on the same roster that each successive year from an Eastern Conference Final appearance, they're going in the wrong direction. So that part, to me, why continue to do more of the same? Mm -hmm. I think there's been some bright spots. I think. Another fantastic year from Noah Dobson that seemingly no one is talking about nationally. You've been, you've been hyping up Dobson all year, uh, but nationally, yeah, not a lot of people. Like, I don't, I don't hear them talking in Vancouver, but wherever it might be, I'm not see, I'm not seeing it elsewhere. Um, I just think this team needs a shot in the arm. I think Barzell needs help. Um, you think Barzell's an elite player? I do. You think he's a franchise player? I do. Okay, we disagree. I, I just think he hasn't had proper support. Okay. I can get behind that. I can't. Um, what, what part about him doesn't... Why do you not think he is? Because he's to me, he's a perimeter player. And I just don't think perimeter players are franchise types of players. They're compliments. He's an all-star. I've ne I, I think he's an all-star caliber talent. But when I watch him play, he just plays way around the edges. And I think that he holds on to the puck. I don't think he brings up the level necessarily of guys around him. Um, so I don't think he's a franchise cornerstone. I think Noah Dobson is, is heading in that direction. He's close. Um, I think Sorokin although not this year, but I think, I think Barzell is more of a complimentary piece and an all-star caliber talent, but I do not think he's a franchise cornerstone type of forward. I, I just, I just don't, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't think so. I, it's a fair opinion. I Probably mean, loves I, this debate. and, and look, it sounds like it's one that you guys have had, mm -hmm. um, repeatedly not really honestly we really Most haven't it's more fan, fans yeah. you know get get in my face about that and and you know i i had this kind of uh, di you know differing of opinion with a number of islanders fans when i said Braden point is um world's better player than matt barzell like i said every gm in the nhl i think would pick point over barzell if you had one spot on your team and it was between those two players every that is I correct I said, uh, including out of the Islander GM. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where that whole debate got sparked, where people are telling me that he's not, Barzell's a better player than Point. Point just has better players to play with. And like, I just find that to be. Um, well, I just, I, they're two totally different yeah. players. Yeah. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah, but they're both counted on to score. And one but scores Barzell's a never been a scorer in the NHL. 
So then how's he a franchise cornerstone if he's not a scorer? Playmaker. How many playmakers do you see end up oh, being? Okay, so the longest saying, time, when I say score, when I say score, I mean points. I don't necessarily just mean goals. Okay, he, I mean he's, a point. He's, point he's going to be north of a point per game this year. And I do agree that Braden Point has definitely had better. He's got support seventy-three around. points in seventy games. It's his best season since twenty seventeen eighteen. Since his rookie year, right? He's gonna he's gonna finish probably at eighty-five somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. And what is he in his tenth year? No. Eighth. Ninth. Ninth season, I believe. This is I think right now. Seventh. So his, you've been his this right now, but he, here's my point. Right now, his current he's he's at his career high in goals, which is 22, and he's got 73 points. That's 51 assists. They said there would be no math. Point <laughs> is a 50 goal scorer. Like we're not comparing apples to apples. Points at 40 goals this year already. We're just not. What we're looking at is probably I and I don't I don't he's not as good, so forgive this comparison, Johnny. But what you're looking at to me is more along the lines of a of a Panarin type player. If we're just thinking pure archetype and and how they approach the game, he's way more in line with a Panarin than a point. I agree. But just not but not as good. I mean, nowhere near as effective. No, but like also look at Panarin seasons up until this same age and their numbers probably aren't crazy different. Panarin's had like three straight 90 point years, I think. Okay. But look at, look at Panarin and his age mm -hmm. and look at the, when he came over. Yeah. He was initially scoring some more goals than, um, than Barzell is now. But he still had 77, 74, 82, 87. Mm -hmm. Then he came to the Rangers. They're, they're, those numbers aren't crazy different. Yeah. I mean, listen, we could we could argue this. We do it every week. With So, but then with how did, ball. my yeah. big question is, how did Panarin go from that to 43 goals this year? What was the big change in Panarin's game that's gotten him it's, there? It's his right winger. We all know that. <laughs> so then doesn't that bring us back to the support argument that i just i just the point that i made yeah he's playing with a future 100 point player obviously he's going to put up 40 plus goals come on oh, what, yeah. are what are we doing what are we, what are we doing go. here what are we doing here all right on but, that all right look frank yeah. frank we got we thank gotta, we gotta continue you. here thank you for your time today um we'll we'll, we'll ask you better. next week about all the ufas we wanted to get to today carolina's got, got a boatload uh, of guys we got uh three months from this week, Friday, to get to uh, no three months from next Monday is to what talk the draft. UFA, so I I ain't worried. I'll be here. All right, all right, buddy. Have right, a good day. Feel better. All right. See you guys.